So Luke chapter 1, starting verse 26, it says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. So church, what does it mean that Mary was betrothed to Joseph? Well, in that day, there were three stages to a Jewish wedding. And so I'm going to give you just such a brief look at this. Uh, first, there was the engagement, and uh, for the most part, that was a formal agreement made by the fathers. Well, the children were probably still quite young. Next came the betrothal. And this was the ceremony where mutual promises were made between the two people. And then finally, marriage. The marriage occurred approximately one year after the betrothal, when the bridegroom came for his bride at an unexpected time. And we're hoping for that soon, right? We're hoping he comes for us, because we know it's an unexpected time. So here we have Joseph and Mary in the middle stages of a Jewish marriage when the angel Gabriel appears to her. And in those days when a couple was betrothed, they were under the obligations of faithfulness, and a divorce was the only way to break the betrothal. So this is not a casual promise. This wasn't, hey, let's try living together like they do nowadays. This was a very strong commitment to one another. It involved obligations of faithfulness, but without intimacy. Continuing in verse 28, it says, And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, Well, how can this be, since I do not know a man? Okay, I don't know about you, but uh, if I was to meet an angel, I'd probably freak out, have an anxiety attack, run in a hide. Um, even just the angels we had in here over the, <laughs> like some of them, I really like, wow. That's, anyway. <laughs> but that's typically what happens to people when, it, when we read our Bibles and we hear of an angel that appears to somebody, what are they typically, what's their reaction? Typically they're afraid. What does an angel typically say to the human being that they're addressing? Fear not. Do not be afraid. So I can only imagine what it would be like for Mary, a teenage girl, maybe 15 to 16 years old, when she was visited by the angel Gabriel. He wasn't just some regular angel. And told something so incredible, it wouldn't even seem believable. But Mary keeps it together as this mighty angel says to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Now, church, I want you to notice a few things here. I'm going to address uh, something that's happened within parts of the church. Because um, this greeting has been turned into something that's just not true and has misled millions of people. And I'll tell you what this is. The angel Gabriel never worshiped Mary or prayed to her. He simply greeted her and stated three specific things about Mary. And each of these specific things were certainly true about her. And she was blessed with an incredibly unique privilege among any person who's ever lived. So church, what are the three things? First, the angel Gabriel said she was highly favored, and that's true. Then the angel Gabriel said that the Lord is with her, and that's also true. And last, the angel said she was blessed among women. And that's true. And these are all great things, but in reality, they're true of believers in Christ. So what's my point? It's just this. Mary was a young teenage woman. She was obviously a very righteous young woman to be selected of all women in history to, bear the, to be the one to bear God's son. But I want you to realize this, that as righteous as Mary was, the scripture records that Mary was blessed among women, not above women. Mary, the earthly mother of Jesus, was and is a believer in Jesus Christ, who is her savior, 
just as all of us who have put our faith in Jesus Christ and nothing more. Mary has been as wonderful as she is elevated to a place where she would not even want to be thought of and through certain religious circles. So I just wanted to clear that up. So the other thing I want to mention is scripture makes it clear that Mary was a virgin and it's critical to understand this truth. Why? Well, because this miracle was like no other miracle. When we read about the conception of Isaac being conceived through his extremely elderly parents, Abraham and Sarah, and John, even the John the Baptist, and there were others, that was a miracle because of their age. But those births were still within the earthly realm. The conception of the Messiah was outside of the earthly realm and could never be duplicated again because our Messiah was conceived through a virgin birth. In verse 29, it says, But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Now, I can understand why Mary was troubled, but I don't believe she was doubtful. And I'll explain that in a minute. In verse 30, it says, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom there shall be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? <clears throat> Church, look at, what, look at Mary's question to the angel. How can this be since I do not know a man? Don't you think that's a very logical question? I don't think she was doubting him that this was going to happen. She just said, like, how is this going to happen? In fact, she asked the same question Zacharias asked in Luke 8, 118, but with a huge difference. Zacharias' question was asked in a skeptical unbelief, but Mary's question was asked in wonder-filled faith. She believed the angel Gabriel. She just didn't know how that was possible. So the angel Gabriel explained to her, in verse 35, when he said, And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And there it is. The answer given by the angel is that it's impossible by human reckoning for this to happen, that a virgin could become pregnant with a child. But what is impossible for man is possible only through the Holy Spirit. Here then we have a sublime, off-filled statement of the incarnation. Mary's son would be God manifest in the flesh. I heard it said, language cannot exhaust the mystery that is shrouded here. And I agree that some things are not easily explained or even understood in this life. And this, my brothers and sisters in Christ, a virgin birth, is simply a matter of faith. All right, I'm going to move on from that. We're going to go right to Luke chapter 2. Uh, if you guys want to turn there. <clears throat> it says in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place when Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Church, this really happened. This is history. This is his story. God's story and it's truth that cannot be denied. We're living in a world now where there are just evil people making statements that Jesus is fake news. Um, they'll find out soon enough. Hopefully they'll get saved before. The reality is that the Old Testament contains many prophecies that were perfectly fulfilled by the birth of Jesus. And I was going to go through them all. I thought about doing that, but uh, we don't, just don't have the time this morning. But I want to look at a, just a few. For instance, God promised the Savior's virgin birth immediately after mankind's first sin in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 
Then in the time of the prophets, the prophet Micah foretold the birth of Christ in the small town of Bethlehem. It says in Micah 5.2, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. This prophecy was fulfilled when Jesus' earthly parents, Mary and Joseph, were called to Bethlehem for a census of the entire Roman territory. While they were in Bethlehem, the time came for Jesus to be born. This baby, Emmanuel, which means God with us, is named Jesus. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he is our Savior. He's called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Someday I'd like to go through the whole, just all the different prophecies about the birth of Jesus, um, but just don't have time today. Um, I want to talk more about how this tiny newborn baby was and is the savior of the world and how he is the only hope for all generations and I think never more important than to this current generation. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. You agree? Amen. It says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This baby that we talk about today is God's own Son. As some of you may know, Debbie and I had two children, and they each had three children, so we have six grandchildren. Pretty good at math, always have been. And the anticipation of seeing each of those brand new babies for the first time was just so thrilling. With such expectation, we waited for them to be born. And it never gets old. I think you'll agree that there's something so precious about a brand new life, getting to hold them and smell them, well, at least most of the time, (laughs) and think about what God plans to do with their lives. It's a very precious moment. And that's what we celebrate here today. Our Redeemer, our Savior and King was born into this world as a precious newborn baby, just as God said he would. Unlike all other babies, this baby was fully God and fully man, and unlike most parents, Joseph and Mary knew God's plan for their child. They knew who this newborn child would become because the scriptures foretold his future, and the angel Gabriel spoke these words to Mary. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There will be no end. Man, that would be a responsibility to raise that boy. Joseph and Mary knew that this child she had just delivered was the son of the highest and that he was the savior of the world, the king of kings and the lord of lords, and that he would reign over the house of Jacob forever, that his kingdom would never end. But think this through. What were the circumstances under which this king of kings was born? Jesus certainly wasn't born into this world with the fanfare that you would expect. When royalty is being born, for instance, like the way the world anticipates the next heir to the British throne. There were no months of public speculation and excitement, no endless magazine articles written, no myriad of reporters and cameras just clicking away and waiting for a chance to capture the early moments of a future monarch. No, it was just Joseph and Mary, some animals, and maybe a few relatives and the shepherds. As scripture records in Luke chapter two, so it was that while they were there, The days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Okay, this is where we're going to get a little bit detail-oriented. Bear with me. I just want to address a few details of his birth that tradition seems to have kind of played with a little bit from Scripture. It says in the Scriptures that because of the crowds that... They had come to Bethlehem, due in most part to the census. There was no room at the inn for Mary and Joseph. Traditionally, the inn is thought of as what, church? Like a hotel, motel. Nowadays, it would be like a bed and breakfast. 
Uh, we don't really know for sure, but that's the tradition that's seen in most Christmas stories and movies. I'm going to read to you a typical explanation of what happened the night Jesus was born. I'm not saying this is the same. Everybody's heard the same one, but this is kind of the idea. Bethlehem around 2,000 years ago. We see Joseph and Mary arrive at the little town of Bethlehem in the middle of the night. Mary already in labor is riding on a donkey while Joseph frantically searches for a room at the local inn. Desperate, he begs the reluctant innkeeper for any place at all to have this baby. The innkeeper finally relents and makes room for them in a tumble-down stable with the cows and the sheep and other barn animals. The only problem with this story is it isn't what the Bible teaches. The true history has perhaps been altered slightly through stories and plays and books and movies and that have dramatized the Christmas story for the sake of entertainment. But the real birth account seems to be just a little bit different. Now, don't leave. I'm not going to do anything weird, okay? Um, so we just read, and it said, So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the Cataluma. What do your Bibles say? Everybody's got New King James, King James, ESV. Okay. If you go to um, NLT says lodging and the NIV says guest room. So when you, when you look at the word cataluma in the Greek, it's a Greek word for um, the word that they translated in where Jesus was born. It's typically considered to be a guest room. So there was no room in the guest room. It's amazing to me how the NIV actually got this the most correct, it seems. But I'm not beating up NIV. It's fine. You can get saved reading the NIV. So <laughs> I'm fine if you read that. It could best be translated guest room. So this changes a thing a bit in the Christmas story. Look at it this way. Um, this one fact has led some to believe that Jesus may not have been born in a stable or a barn, but in a house with a lower floor serving as a nighttime shelter for the family's animals, which is very common in that time. They, would, they had a home, and in that home, obviously, there was probably a guest room, and then they had this area where they kept the animals. So that's what, when you look through this, that's what it seems like was happening. Joseph and Mary had gotten to the residence. They were staying there, but because everybody was coming in from the census and pouring in, the house was full. And so they chose to have the baby Jesus in the room that's kept for the animals. And this maybe answers a question that I've had since I was a kid attending Collingwood, Collingwood Baptist Church back in the 60s. I'm not sure if anybody have ever wondered this, but I've always wondered why Joseph would make his betrothed Mary travel all that way on a donkey when she was about to deliver their child with no idea where they would spend the night. I always thought that was weird. But I don't think he did. I now believe the scriptures clearly say that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. The Bible also never mentions how they traveled to Bethlehem or that she rode a donkey into Bethlehem the same night she was to deliver. The truth is that they, already, they were already in Bethlehem, probably staying with family, which was a tradition of the day, and because the Cataluma, the guest room, was full, and privacy was at a premium, they chose to use the lower level of the house where the animals were kept. Now, this would change the way a lot of people understand the events surrounding his birth. For instance, the Bible never mentions a terrible innkeeper that turned Joseph and Mary away that night. There's no separate stable, barn, or cave that we all see in our nativity scenes. But here's the thing. I'm not trying to spoil your idea of Christmas. If you go home and you have a beautiful nativity scene, it's great. Enjoy it. That's not the point. But we should give thought as to how these events actually happened. And for to be true, nobody knows exactly how it happened. The Bible doesn't say. Uh, one other thing I'm going to just... How many wise men were there? No, you guys are smart. You know better. You've heard this a thousand times. Yeah, it says there was three wise men. We have that tradition due to the fact there was three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The reality is we don't know how many wise men there were. 
When did the wise men show up? The night of the birth? Could have been one to two years after the birth before the wise men showed up. Just little details about the story. So if some, anybody's asking you, you can answer some of those questions. Now, here's the point. Does it really matter if Jesus was born in a cave, a stable, or a barn, or the lower level of a house? No, not really. You can still display your nativity scenes, but understand that whatever the place was, it wasn't a place where you would expect any child to be born, let alone God's only son, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. What we do know is that Jesus was born at night, in some sort of place where they kept animals, although I don't think animals are even mentioned in the scriptures. And after he was delivered, Mary, his mother, wrapped him in swaddling cloths. That's a whole other thing, place we could go and placed him in a manger, which is another whole topic we could talk about, but don't have time. And for clarification, he wasn't born in a manger because that would have been kind of weird. Mary placed him in a manger. Side note about how crazy our world has become. Uh, did you know there's such a thing as a baby cot of pure gold crib? They actually make one. Do you know what the, the value is if you wanted to buy one? $15 million. Can you imagine spending that to have your baby sleep? But back to reality. Why was our Savior and King born in a place where animals were kept? And why was he laid in the animal's food trough? Doesn't it seem like he deserved a privileged birth in the most elegant of surroundings? Perhaps a huge castle called the Bethlehem Hilton where servants and guards and the best of everything money could buy was, like a baby caught of pure gold. But instead, God sends his only begotten son into this world in the lowliest of circumstances, and in doing so, his humble birth conveys an amazing message to creation. <clears throat> Instead of coming to earth as a pampered, privileged ruler, Jesus was born in meekness, just like one of us. Why? Because he's a king that understands his people. He is a king that will always be approachable, accessible, and available. No palace gates barred the way to him. No battalion of security prevents our approach to him. No, the king of kings, our God and creator, came humbly to this earth as a baby, born of a virgin in the town of Bethlehem, and his first bed was a manger. He became like one of us. It says in Luke 2.52, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus grew up like one of us and needed to grow in wisdom. Jesus' human experience was like this. He never ceased being God, but in some things he veiled his divinity in accordance with the Father's will. The Son subjected himself to physical, intellectual, social, and spiritual growth. Jesus, the Son of God, voluntarily put himself in the position of needing to assimilate knowledge as a man. And he experienced the things we experienced. He was tempted like we're tempted, but without sin. And that's what we know from Scripture. That's the God we serve. And in thinking about this, when I was doing this message back in 2017, um, one day when I was holding our newest grandchild, Katie, little Katie, she's a baby, I couldn't help but think what it was like for Joseph and Mary to look upon their newborn helpless child and know that this child was their Messiah, <coughs> the Messiah of the world. I remember staring at our youngest grandchild, Katie, in amazement at how tiny she was and how little her hands and feet were. And I thought about that night more than 2,000 years ago when Joseph and Mary were looking upon their newborn son and also noticing how small he was. And I only wonder if when they were looking at his tiny hands, scriptures came to their mind like in Isaiah 48 where it says, Indeed, my hand has laid the foundation of the earth and my right hand has stretched out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand up together. This tiny baby is the one who created the universe by speaking it into existence and holds everything together in his hands. Look at what it says in Colossians 1 when speaking of Jesus in verse 15. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things. And in him all things consist. 
and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. I have to be honest and say it's still a mystery to me that the hands of God could be so small. How those tiny little fingers reaching into the night sky were the very hands that measured out the sky. This baby is the one who spoke everything into existence. This baby is God's love reaching down to save the world by sending his only begotten son. This baby, this servant king was here with us and he's still here with us to those who believe. Think about how his infant eyes have seen the dawn of time and his tiny ears have heard an angelic symphony and yet Mary still had to rock him to sleep. This baby would grow up into a man, tempted as we are, but who lived a perfect, sinless life to be our savior. He is the one who walks on water and speaks to the sea and it obeys him. He is the one who stands in the fire beside us and the one who roars like a lion and yet bled as a lamb to save us. He is the name the believer calls on in time of trouble and it's his voice that calms the storm that rages. He is our Messiah, our Savior and there is power in his name. He is the one who heals our wounds and he is our rock and our redeemer and there is no one like him. The conception of Jesus was a miracle that a virgin would conceive is truly a one-time miracle. But his birth, as great a miracle as it was, wasn't the greatest event in history. His death and resurrection are the greatest single event in all of history. Amen? Amen. On that night some 2,000 years ago when the baby Jesus was born into this world, it was those tiny hands and feet that three decades later would be pierced for our transgressions, nailed to a wooden cross. He would surrender his perfect sinless life and die on that cross to take the punishment for our sins and on the third day, rise again that we might have eternal life. Amen? Amen. That's our joy today in Christmas. When we think about Christmas and our Lord, we have life in him. So today, as you go to your homes and spend time with family and friends, I want you to enjoy giving gifts and receiving gifts because that's fun. But I also want you to know this. If you have received the gift that God has given to the world and his son Jesus, then you have been given the greatest gift that can ever be given. The other stuff will be nice, it'll be fun, but it doesn't compare. No present that you unwrap today can compare to the gift of eternal life that God has offered to the entire world. If you haven't put your faith in Jesus, don't wait, don't put it off any longer. Repent of your sin and ask for forgiveness and by faith believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That's what scripture teaches us. God has already done all the work, but what you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. As it says in John 14, 6. Jesus speaking, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So in closing, we're going to wrap up early. Huh? Excited? I can go on. There's more. No. Uh, In closing, remember this Christmas season that there are those who have lost loved ones those who are going through difficult trials. For many, Christmas can truly become a difficult time, and as the days grow darker, I think this is becoming more and more common. There are many people who are in need of encouragement at this time of year. They don't need a store-bought Christmas present. They need the thrill of joy, and that only comes through the best gift of all. They need Jesus and his forgiveness and presence in their lives, and they need to be reminded of what this season is all about. It's not about stuff. It's not about presents. It's not about dinner with the family. Now, these all have their place, and I encourage you to do them, and they are a wonderful part of the Christmas tradition, and they do at times have great significance. But what we need to remember is the essential message of Christmas, which is Emmanuel, God with us. So for the hurting person, the lonely person, the person who's overwhelmed with sadness or grief, 
This is the time of year to bring the gift of encouragement to them and tell them what the message of Christmas really is. And it's this. God will be with you. God will help you. God will strengthen you. And God will sustain you. In Jesus, we find our joy. Amen? Amen. So I ask you as you leave here this morning to ask God to give you opportunity to share that gift, the gift of eternal life, with someone else today. Celebrate his birth today by sharing the truth of his death and resurrection with somebody that he places in your path. Don't jam it down their throat. Just look for the opportunity. God bless you, brothers and sisters in our Lord. And Lord willing, I will see you all again very soon or maybe on the way up. You never know. It could happen. All right? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to come to just once again, Lord, go through the story of your birth, the reason why you came, the fact that you were willing to do this is beyond our ability to comprehend how you, God, could become one of us just so that you could live a life of sinless perfection for the purpose of being crucified on a cross and taking the wrath of the penalty of our sin and dying on that cross and the third day rising again so that we can have eternal life. Lord, it's beyond our comprehension. But thank you that you did it, Father. Thank you that you sent your son. Thank you, Jesus, that you, that you did what you needed to do to save us, Lord. So I just pray, Lord, as we go out and we have meet with family and friends, that it would just be a wonderful time of just getting together with people we haven't seen for a while. And I just hope that it doesn't just become worldly, that we can also remember Pray it at the dinner time or, or you look for opportunities, Lord, just to share your love with others. So, Lord, we just thank you. Pray you'll bless our day and pray that we'll be a blessing to you, Lord, as we go about our lives. We ask all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.